and welcome to another episode of SCFG Live, Science Club for Girls Live. I'm Hannah with Science Club for Girls, and that was Mr. Music with your theme song. Woo, there it is. It's so great to see everyone today. If you haven't done so already, be sure to write your name in the chat so we know who's here with us. I'm so excited to jump back into another episode, but before we do, let's bring in our first guest so we can hear what's in store for today. Hi, Hannah. Hi, Namisha. Hi. I'm Namisha. I can't believe it's already our second episode, but this one's going to be extra special because we have another special guest who's going to be joining us that we'll meet in a little bit. I know, Namisha. I'm so excited, but before... That, can you believe how much we learned about adaptations of both reptiles and amphibians last week? Yep, we had such cool experiments to show how reptiles and amphibians have certain adaptations that allow them to survive in their different environments. That's right. Reptiles have that hard and scaly skin, so they can adapt to their hotter and drier environments, while amphibians have that slimy, porous skin, so they can breathe in their wetter environments through their skin. Cool. Hey everyone, type in the comments what your favorite part about our reptiles and amphibians experiment was. Hannah, what was your favorite part? Well, my favorite part was definitely the experiment with the eggs. I thought it was so cool how we could see that food coloring going through the egg without the shell, showing that it was porous, while the egg with the shell had a hard time letting that food coloring through. And it was cool to see how that represented amphibian skin and reptile skin. I know. And wasn't it cool how you could use any food coloring that you wanted and it had the same effect? Really cool. I liked playing around with different colors. Yeah. Our experiments last week were so fun. But today, we're going to have even more fun because we're going to hear from our friend Marianne at the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy. Some of you may remember Marianne from our Water Water Everywhere episode. If you missed it, be sure to check it out on our episode on our website. Hannah, can you tell me a little bit about the Atlantic White Shark Conver Conservancy? Sure. They're a really cool organization that's located right here in Massachusetts on Cape Cod. So not that far away. And they focus on white shark conservation and research, which means they'll often study the movement patterns of sharks to see if there are any patterns in places that they go to feed and to have babies, which is kind of cool. And they also teach local students and adults all about sharks so they can learn more about sharks and how they're so important to our aquatic ecosystem. Awesome. They sound super cool. Today, Marianne is going to help us answer the question, how sharks move. She's first going to tell us a little bit about the movement of sharks, and then she's going to show us a really cool activity that all of you can follow along with. If you haven't downloaded the materials for this activity, check it out in the link in the video description. You can also just use some paper, you'll need a scissors, maybe some tape or glue, and the activity guide. Awesome. Now, as you learn from Marianne, feel free to put any questions or comments in the chat. Namisha and I are going to pop in occasionally to address those questions and read some of the comments. And we have some special trivia questions for you as well. So let's make sure that you're listening closely and let's get into it. You ready, Namisha? I'm super pumped. Let's let's see it, Anna. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Marianne, and I'm the Education Director at the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy. We are a nonprofit organization based on Cape Cod in Massachusetts, and I'm so excited to be here with you all today to talk about one of my favorite subjects, sharks. And most specifically, we're going to be diving in and exploring one of the questions we often get. How do sharks move? So we've seen videos, we've seen photos of not just white sharks, but all different species as they move throughout the water. And it definitely gets people wondering, how do they do it, right? How are they so fast? How can they glide so gracefully? What is it that enables them to do this? And I think one of the big questions that people often look at is not just how do they swim, because they are a fish. So we know that that means by definition, they're gonna have the ability to swim but movement isn't just that forward, you know, swimming along with the swish swish of the tail. Movement can also include incredible movements like this. When you watch this video of this white shark here, 
It doesn't just swim forward, it also breaches out of the surface of the water and it actually jumps out. But let's take a look at that video again. So you can see this white shark as it's swimming. And then scientists refer to that movement when they actually break the surface of the water and come up above the surface as a breach. And that's what you see this white shark doing. All right, and so how is it that the sharks are able to do that? And it's a few different reasons. When we're looking at shark movement, it all has to do with their biology. And specifically, it has to do with the shape of their body, okay? So as I said before, a shark is in fact a fish, which by definition means that it is a marine animal with fins for movement and gills for breathing. When we look at this image of a shark, we can see the different fins along its body here, okay? We know that the shark on its back here has the dorsal fin. So that's the one that again comes off the back. Sharks also have their pectoral fins. These are the fins that are like the arms on the shark that are coming off of the side. And then we also have our caudal fin, all right? And this is the tail fin. Scientists refer to it as the caudal. And since you are all becoming shark smart today, we're going to refer to it as the caudal fin, all right? And that's where we're going to start by explaining that movement of sharks is actually. Whoa, those were so many new terms for me. To keep track of all the shark vocabulary, I've decided to mark up my diagram like this. We have the pectoral fin number one, number two in the back. We have the dorsal fin and the caudal fin. Awesome. Amisha, that's so cool. I did a similar thing too, except I actually kind of colored in where my fins are. So there's the caudal fin in the back, there's the dorsal fin up top, and then the pectoral fin at the bottom. So many new terms, it's really helpful to write them down. And if you don't have this worksheet at home, you can draw a picture of the shark and just label your picture. Very good idea. Let's keep watching. I'm going to keep taking notes. Actually looking at the caudal fin. So the caudal fin is made up of an upper and lower lobe. And unlike whales or dolphins, sharks have a side to side movement of their caudal fin. If we were talking about a whale, they would have an up and down movement, okay? But sharks have a side to side movement and that side to side movement is controlled by the muscles in their caudal keel region, which is that area leading up to the caudal fin. And it's a very strong part of the shark, again, because that is what is generating that muscle movement and now allowing that caudal fin to then go from side to side. And when it makes that side to side movement, it's generating what we call a thrust force. Can everyone say that at home for me? Thrust force. And that thrust force is a forward moving force that's gonna propel the shark forward as it moves through the water. So that side to side movement of the tail, okay, controlled by that caudal keel area. The muscles there are gonna generate that side to side movement and that creates that forward thrust force that propels the shark forward as it's going through the water. But as we saw in that video, and as I said, it's not just that swimming forward motion we're talking about. How is it that sharks are able to move up and out of the water? And that's a different force. The force we're looking for there when they can actually move up in the water column and even up out of the surface of the water is actually controlled by their pectoral fins. So again, those are the fins on the side of the shark, almost like an arm fin. And these fins, what happens to generate a force here is they are going to get water moving underneath these fins and that generates our lift force. Can everyone say that for me? Lift force. So this lift force, if we zoom in a little bit closer, is what's gonna allow the shark to move up in the water column. And it does that because once it's moving forward with that thrust force, then water is gonna start to move underneath those pectoral fins. And this creates an imbalance in water pressure between the top of the fin and the bottom of the fin, which allows that lift force to be created. And that's what's gonna allow the shark to actually move up in the water column and even break the surface of the water with what we called a breach, okay? That is so cool that sharks can move in so many different ways by using certain parts of their body. Like 
She was saying that they can use they can move forward developing that thrust force using their caudal fin, but they can also move up and down, creating a lift force by using their pectoral fin. It's like they're designed to do all these really cool movements with their bodies. Exactly. I even labeled the different forces, Hannah, and helped me really understand the different forces. Oh, that's awesome. Very cool. Does this make you think of anything that we might have made as humans? These going forward with the thrust force and maybe lifting up in the air with a lift force? Hmm. It's kind of like an airplane for liftoff into the air. It really makes me think about the ways we can move through the water. What parts of our bodies do we use to move forward in the water? And which part parts of our bodies do we use to move up and down through water? Write your answers in the chat. Hmm. Well, I know when I go swimming, I use my arms and move them back and forth and to help me move through the water. And then sometimes I'll use my feet to kick, 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 kick and kind of go up in the water too. So very cool relation. Sometimes I like to pretend that I'm a shark too. Also, I noticed that Shirley dropped on the call. Jumped on the call. Hey, Shirley. Hi, Shirley. Be sure to write any comments or questions that you have about sharks in the chat. Let's keep watching. So these two forces, thrust, which is the side to side movement propelling the shark forward in the water, and then lift when it gets that water moving underneath the pectoral fins and actually has the ability to move up in the water column, work together, enabling the shark to move. The other part of their biology that really helps in their movement is the fact that they have a skeleton completely made up of cartilage, okay? And so when we look at that skeleton made out of cartilage, it's much more flexible than if the shark had a skeleton that was actually made up of bone. By having that skeleton completely made up of cartilage, it allows for more flexibility in movement of the shark. If it was bone, it would be a bit more rigid. And so because we need this caudal keel section to really generate that side to side movement of the caudal fin area, it needs to be able to move back and forth. And so that skeleton made out of cartilage really helps that to actually happen. We're Is our skeleton made of cartilage? Good question. But our skeleton is actually made of bone. Bone is less flexible than cartilage. We do have cartilage in our bodies though. Feel your ear, for example. See how easy it is to bend it? Both of them. Oh. That's cartilage. That's really interesting. That's definitely more flexible and bendy than something like our arm, like this bone. That's, I can't really bend that. Something else that I think has cartilage is our nose. I can easily move my nose back and forth like that. Very yeah. cool. I can see how the flexibility of cartilage in a shark skeleton can be really helpful, especially because it needs to do that quick side to side movement to move forward and generate that thrust force. That's a really cool adaptation that we'll talk about later. Let's keep watching. When we're looking at the way the shark moves through the water here, all right, then something to keep in mind as we think about this is, is Newton's first law of motion, also known as the law of inertia. An object at rest stays at rest, and an object in motion stays in motion with the same speed and in the same direction, unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. Now, what does this happen or have to do with shark movement? As our shark is generating that thrust force and that lift force as it moves through the water, we've seen those images where the shark reaches the surface, but it comes back down. Or, the shark is swimming super fast and then it starts to slow down. This is where Newton's first law comes in because there are other forces in the ocean that are acting on the shark that can change up a bit how it is actually going to move. Uh, so Marianne just said that there's other forces that are acting on the shark maybe acting in opposite uh, opposite directions of the way the shark's moving. So instead of like when the shark's going like this way, a force is going this way. And when the shark's going up, a force is going down. What might be some of those forces that are acting on the shark in the opposite direction of its movement? Hmm. If you know any forces, 
that might be acting on the shark, be sure to write them in the chat. I'll give you a hint. This is a force that's also working on us right now. And it's the reason why we're not just floating around in this room and I can stay in this chair right now. Hmm. Do you have any ideas, Amy? It must be acting on all of us, Hannah, because I'm also sitting here too. So it's not just on certain, it's on all of us, right? Hmm. What acts on all of us? That's a good question. Be sure to write in the chat and we'll shout you out in the next break. Let's take a look and see what Marianne says. Okay. So one of those forces is drag. So as the shark is generating that thrust force and moving forward, okay, there is a drag force that is actually pushing against the shark. And that has to do with it being in the water. So that water is a fluid and it's creating and it's going to try to slow that shark down. So my hand is that water moving over the shark. The shark's going to overcome this drag force by creating that thrust force, but also because of the torpedo-like shape of their body. Notice how the nose on the shark comes to a nice point. This enables it to break through the fluid of the ocean, so it can try to break through reducing drag. The other force that the shark is going to have to overcome is gravity, because sharks here on Earth and everything here on Earth is affected by gravity. So gravity is that downward force, right? So it's trying to pull down on the shark and keep it down by the ocean floor. And we know that sharks, there are some sharks that like to hang out on the ocean floor, but white sharks, they need to be up by the surface so that they can feed on seals. Um, they need to be up in the water column so maybe they can catch a tuna, all right? They need to be able to move around. They can't be down, held down by gravity on the ocean floor. So think back in the forces that we talked about. Is it thrust that's going to overcome gravity? No, it is lift. So that ability to move up in the water column is what's going to overcome the gravitational pull, allowing sharks to have that movement. But when they aren't having that lift force or when they breach the surface, it's gravity that does bring them back down into the water column. Okay. So gravity is going to be pulling down on the shark and the shark overcomes gravity. I'm sorry, gravity is pulling down and then drag is pushing against the shark, all right, trying to slow it down. But the shark, because of its body and its skeleton, is going to generate that thrust force by using its muscle and that flexible its cartilage, cartilaginous skeleton to overcome drag and move forward. And in doing so, it can then generate that lift force allowing it to move up in the water column. So as we talk about all these forces and we look at how sharks move, hearing words like thrust and lift, does this make you think of something that is human made that moves through a fluid? Not necessarily the fluid like our ocean, but maybe the fluid like the air? If you're thinking of an airplane, then you are correct. And there are some engineers who have actually used the design and the shape of a shark to design some modern day airplanes because they both have to move through a fluid and they both have to overcome gravity and drag. So this is how sharks move. It all has to do with forces and making this connection to an airplane and thinking about it that way what we want you to do at home today is we want you to actually create your own shark airplane. And so what you're going to need at home to do this, you can use a ruler, you can have some crayons, you can use glue or tape, whichever you have at home that's easiest. You're also going to need a pair of scissors, some construction paper, or you can dig in the recycle bin and take out an old newspaper or maybe some old school papers always good to recycle. And then we uploaded a worksheet with some pre-made shark fins that you can use. And before cutting those fins out, I do recommend that if you're going to color them in, you should absolutely do so. But then once you've colored them in, you're going to need to cut out each of the fins that we talked about today, like the dorsal fin that we see here on our shark. There's also a caudal fin in there, okay? just like the caudal fin on our shark. And then there are two pectoral fins. So I didn't color my fins in today, but you are more than welcome to do so. 
because what you're going to do is then use your construction paper or the recycled paper that you have at home and you're going to make your very own shark paper airplane. Now, I'm not an expert on airplanes, okay, but in making a paper airplane, I like to go with the most basic model. So step one is to actually just hold your paper horizontal and then fold it in half like so. So I'm gonna get a nice crease on the bottom here, okay? I do recommend that when you're doing this at home, you put it down on a hard surface. It'll make it a bit easier for you. I want you guys to see what I'm doing though, so. And then you can use your ruler to then really flatten it out and get a nice crease on there, okay? And then the next step you're going to do is you're gonna choose one end and you're gonna split the half like so. I'm gonna take this corner piece here and I'm going to bend it down, making a triangle like so. So this is creating, because we know we have to overcome that drag force. So by bending down and making that triangle, which I'm gonna have to put it down to actually get that fold so I can get it nice and tight. This is going to then enable us to have that nice pointed nose on our shark plane so that it can overcome drag, right? It can break through the fluid in front of us. So this shows one side. So now I have to do the same thing on the other side. Again, this is to create that nice pointed nose so that it can break through the air to help overcome that drag force. So now this is what the front of my shark plane looks like, okay? This is that side view. So I have these two flaps, okay? So now the next step I'm going to do is I'm gonna take one of these sides and I'm actually going to fold this down again. And this is where you can do this a few different ways, but I'm just gonna to try to get this as flush down as possible, okay? So I'm gonna create more of a long triangle here. Now you might have your own folding technique for a paper airplane at home. And you might have some really cool designs that you have learned how to make. You can make your paper airplane however you would like. And before even folding it, if you wanna color in your paper, you are more than welcome to do so, okay? Now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna start making that fold on the other side. Okay, so this is what the top, see now I have this nice kind of um, diamond shape but this is then what my paper airplane looks like from the side. So I have that nice nose here. I have two wings, all right? So this is what my paper airplane is going to look like. I have my wings, I have my nice nose, okay? But it's not very sharky, is it? No. So this is where we're gonna take our cutouts. So when you have your caudal fin cutout, we're gonna do this one first. You'll notice that there is a dashed line going down the center of it. You're actually gonna to wanna to fold that dashed line because then this is gonna give you an area where however you made your paper airplane, the back of it probably has that break where the paper is. I'm gonna tuck that dotted line. So I'm gonna slide it right into the middle there, okay? And then if I put this down, I'm actually gonna tape it to the inside. All right, so here you go. So if I open up my airplane, you see how that is taped to the inside. So now that that's actually taped to the inside, I am then either going to, this is where you can use tape or glue. I'm just gonna put a piece of tape across the back end here just to help hold this together. Because if we get air in the middle of my paper airplane here, that could cause drag. So another technique, if you have a paper clip at home, you can put a tape paper clip down here on the nose because it's gonna help to keep that nose together. You can glue your nose together. You could even put glue right down the middle here because if air gets in here, that's gonna have a result on the effect of drag, which could slow down your plane, okay? So now my plane has its caudal fin. The next fin that I'm gonna actually add. I think it was freezing for a second. Hold on, let me see.
Oh, I'll take it away for a second. I hope everyone's planes are coming out pretty well. Mine's uh, almost done. I have the caudal fin on the back here. Oh, Hannah, I like your SCFG. You like it? I love it. I didn't know what to write. Then I was like, there's only one perfect thing to write. So awesome. I'm going to head back a little bit so you can make sure you didn't miss anything. And then let's jump back in. So here you go. So if I open up my airplane, you see how that is taped to the inside. So now that that's actually taped to the inside, I am then either going to, this is where you can use tape or glue. I'm just going to put a piece of tape across the back end here just to help hold this together. Because if we get air in the middle of my paper airplane here, that could cause drag. So another technique, if you have a paper clip at home, you can put a tape paper clip down here on the nose because it's going to help to keep that nose together. You can glue your nose together. You could even put glue right down the middle here because if air gets in here, that's going to have a result on the effect of drag, which could slow down your plane. Okay, so now my plane has its caudal fin. The next fin that I'm going to actually add is the dorsal fin. So again, your dorsal fin, like the caudal, has this nice uh, dash line across it. So I'm going to take that dash line and that's actually going to get stuck right in to the middle here. So if you are gluing it, you're probably you're going to want to put this in first. Okay, so now my plane has that dorsal fin there. And this actually, for a shark, it's the dorsal fin that helps to add balance, okay? And this dorsal fin on your plane is also going to help to add balance for your plane, all right? So that dorsal fin is going to be pretty important. So now we have our dorsal fin, we have our conal fin. So then we're going to extend our wings by adding our pectoral fins. And when you look at the pectoral fins, you'll notice that one side has a bit to a curve to it. So you want that curve facing backwards because to overcome that drag, we want it to be more rounded in the front, okay? So these are just gonna get taped or glued right onto the sides here. And again, I'm keeping mine pretty basic, but if you wanted to color yours, if maybe at home you have different features, like I said, a paper clip on the nose here can be good. Um, you know, but if you wanted to decorate it however you want to and create your own unique brand of shark planes, we would love to then see pictures or video of how yours does when it's actually flying outside or with permission from an adult flying through the house. So this is what my final shark plane is actually going to look like, okay? And I'm actually going to add one more piece of tape here across the front just to help seal the nose together a little bit better there, okay? So now right here in this room, I've got a computer monitor in front of me. Not the safest place to start flying shark planes around the room, but I'm going to take mine outside in a little bit and I'm going to mark a spot with the snow or maybe a piece of chalk. I'm going to stand behind it and I'm going to launch my shark plane and I'm going to see how far it goes. That's where your ruler can come in, okay? Or I can just take a rock or again, because there's snow on the ground out here in New England right now, I can put some, I can mark that snow and I'll mark point A. Let's say my shark plane really didn't go that far. That sometimes happens when you make paper airplanes. But then it can be good to go back and look at the design of your airplane and think, is there something I could do differently? And think about the forces that you need to create. You're going to generate that thrust force by actually throwing your shark plane forward. And if you throw it forward on a bit of an angle, you're helping generate the lift force because you're already getting some air underneath your wings so that it can move forward, so it can also move upward, okay? Um, but it's going to still have to overcome gravity as well as drag. So you might have to come back and revisit your design. And that's just part of the engineering practice. That's okay. But if you do, go back outside and look for the mark where you marked your launching point. You want to stand at that same point again, throw your shark plane, and hopefully it goes for further than your initial one. Remember, you marked it to see where it went. If it doesn't, go back and maybe your first design was more of the right track, okay? So you can try multiple times and you can try all different designs with your shark plane. Just remember, you need to create something where you're gonna have thrust and you're gonna have lift because you're looking to overcome gravity and drag. So hopefully you all at home had fun learning a bit of today about how sharks move. 
um, and learning about forces. And hopefully you are all making some incredible shark planes that you can fly in a safe spot outdoors or in a nice hallway in your home. Remember, before you start this activity, you should definitely ask an adult for permission before you grab any materials around the house and before you start launching paper shark planes around your home. It was awesome to be with you all today. Again, my name is Marianne and I am at the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy and I really enjoyed spending my Friday afternoon with all of you. I wish you all the best and a very happy weekend. Have a good one. That was so fun. Wow, that was so much fun. And I wish I had that cute stuffed animal white shark just like Marianne did, Hannah. But I bet your airplane looks awesome. Let me see it. Here it is. I got SDF I on both sides. Oh. And I made sure to draw some eyes for my shark. I think I might name him, I don't know, something nice. Sharky. I think his name's Sharky. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> shark too. Yeah, I have twin animal, twin sharks. Have you tried flying yours yet, Namisha? I have not. <laughs> oh, it didn't go too far. I might need to go back to the drawing oh. board. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> That's okay. Well, Namisha, I actually had a question for you. Marianne mentioned a few things about a shark's body that help it to survive in its aquatic environment. Like, for example, I noticed that white sharks have streamlined bodies, like they kind of have a point at the front of their uh, at the front of their bodies that help them to move through the water and overcome that drag force that Marianne kept talking about. And I was wondering, is this an example of an adaptation, like what we talked about last week? You're exactly right. That's an example of an adaptation. And what's super cool is that just like how white sharks have certain adaptations with their fins that help them move through water, it reminds me of what we learned last week about reptiles and amphibians. They have their own adaptations with their skin to help them survive in their environments like we learned. That's a great point. It's really cool to learn about even more adaptations and animals that have adaptations. It was also really cool to honestly learn about how flexible our ears are. I didn't really totally know they were made of cartilage and that's kind of cool. And yeah. it's also really cool to learn how a shark's skeleton was also made of that cartilage and to see how that flexibility of the cartilage really helps the shark to thrive in its aquatic environment. Another adaptation. Exactly. And Shirley, I see that uh, you wanted um, us to name the shark SCFG. Looks like we have triplet SCFG sharks. <laughs> I love it. That's great. Aquatic animals like white sharks are super cool, Hannah. But I wonder how animals who live in really cold environments adapt. That's a great point. I've also been thinking about that too, because it's been pretty cold here in New England. And you're luckily in luck because next week we're going to be talking about more adaptations and we're specifically going to focus on animals that live in those really cold arctic places oh i can't wait i hope you join us for it and it's been another great episode of SCFG Live. science club for girls live we'll see you next week when we talk more about arctic adaptations bye namisha bye hannah